Merci à vous. He is responsible for pioneering many advances in effective filters of PC, including uh, physics, jet physics, and TMD physics. He's one of the, I guess I would say, two, one of the primary editors of the TMD handbook, leading us with that effort. And he's here to tell us about TMD's and jets. Take it away, Tom. Okay, thank you very much uh, for having me and giving me a chance to talk. Uh, the title of my talk is TMDs and Jets. Uh, we haven't had too much discussion of the jets, but chapter nine of the, the handbook is all about jets. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is basically the first three sections, nine, one, nine, two, nine, three. After me, VTEV will give a talk, even VTEV will give a talk, and I'm sure that'll cover the last half of the um, <clears throat> chapter. So my goal in this talk was just to simply highlight the main results that are in nine, one, three, nine, three and also give some of the background material necessary to understand what's going on there. And I'm sure you've all gotten to chapter nine of the, the handbook by now, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so, oh no, that's covering my outline. What's going on? Okay. So the first question we're gonna ask is what is a jet? What does it mean? Why are we interested in them? Uh, I'm going to talk about jet factorization theorems from the point of view from, of the SET. This is based largely on a very big paper written by many people, including our organizer, Chris Lee. Then I'm going to talk about some applications of jets to measuring TMDs. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about jet fragmentation functions. That, that's the subject of 9.2. These are what you have when you take a jet of particles and try to look inside and find a particular hadron and identify hadron as a jet. And that's, I guess, I mean, that's, that's repeated. Well, I don't know, I mean, these are really one of the same thing. Finally, um, I'm gonna talk a little about um, jets with Corconia. Corconia are a very special case for studying uh, TMDs or, or jets with Corconium because typically when you study um, fragmentation, like a TMD fragmentation function to a D meson or a pion, that's an intrinsically non perturbative quantity. We have to go out to get at that from data. Okay. We can calculate the evolution equations for TMD FFs and TMDs, collinear, sorry, collinear fragmentation functions. But we need to do some non perturbative fitting to say what that fragmentation function is. Uh, typically, what's done for collinear fragmentation functions is you sort of do an NLO calculation and perturb the QCD for quarks. And then you look for identified hadrons and the fragmentation is what you have to involve to get from the quark distribution to the hadron distribution. Um, uh, Gorgonia are fundamentally different because the main constituents of a Gorgonia are two, a heavy quark and an anti-quark, okay? There's an, it's an intrinsically perturbative state in some sense, some limited sense. So there's a sense that in which you can actually calculate those fragmentation functions in a framework called NRQCD. So even though this is the last line of my slides here, this will actually constitute over half of my talk because I will have to sort of review Polkonian production theory, Polkonian production phenomenology, tell you a little bit about the outstanding problems in that field, and then tell you how jets with Corconia might shed some light on, on that. And there's a little bit of TMD physics in there too. So some of the things I'm gonna be talking about are not TMD related in some of them all, okay? But, okay. All right, so the first thing, well, what is a jet? A jet is a collimated shower of energetic final state particles. I took that from the first sentence of chapter nine, all right? And it's important to remember that the reason we study jets is because they're there. <laughs> when we smash these hadrons at high colliders, a uh, quark or a gluon is ejected that energetic particle wants to leave the, the interaction. And as it leaves, because of confinement, it doesn't appear as a core or a gluon, it appears as a trail of hadrons. Nobody predicted this, okay? But when they turned on the machines, they saw this, okay? So here is a three-jet event from Desi, and this looks all grainy and old because it's old. 
And you can see there's a bunch of particles going this way, a bunch of particles going this way, a bunch of particles going this way. So this is a three jet event, okay? And when they saw events like this, they said, hold on a second. QCD tells me that the next living order correction to two jet production is a gluon coming off of those, those quark and anti-quark that are created. And they tried calculating the angular distribution using QCD, pretending, this is a laser pointer. yeah, pretending, uh, uh, the red part, pretending that these jet of particles somehow knew something about that initial parton. Okay, nobody could prove that. They just did it and it seems to work. Okay, so uh, fundamentally underlying jet physics is the idea that hydrogenization doesn't change the total energy of these particles relative to the initial parton uh, too much if the parton is sufficiently energetic. And so studying these things called jets um, allows us to look at the partons in some sense, even though it's a confined pH there. Um, just to get up to date, I looked around for pictures of jets. Here's jets at CMX. You can see there's several groups of particles that they lump into one, two, three, four, six different jets. Okay. And I, I put this up there because I thought it looked pretty. Okay. Um, how are jets defined? Oh boy. Is there any way we can set things up so my whole talk is actually like so because there's stuff missing here? Yeah, let's see what's going on there. Go for this file and after that. Sure. I'm happy to do that. If that's going to work, if just scrolling like that, yeah, okay, sure. Okay. Yeah, what the right, the this thing, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do one of these, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. All right, so I don't know much about jet algorithms, just what they tell me, but but it's an important idea in the sense that jets aren't physical quantities in the same way like a pion is. Nature gives us a pion, we define jet algorithms to get jets. And so what's very popular, especially in Hadron Colliders, there's a bunch of clustering al algorithms. So the variables here are rapidity, azimuthal angle, PT. These variables are used because they're boost invariant along the beam axis. In a Hadron Collider, you gotta do that, okay? <clears throat> um, you can concoct some distance measure between two particles in the final state. So you start with, you know, you see your event, you have a list of particles. Okay, for each one of those particles, you compute, for each pair of particles, you compute a DIJ, which is defined by this, okay, formula here. This is their separation in, in rapidity and phi space. This is R, this is a parameter you choose, it defines the approximate jet size, we'll see. And then you, you can weight it by PT squared raised to the power of P. You can also define something called DIB, which is just the i particles power, uh, momentum raised to the TP power. And commonly used things are P equals one, P equals zero, and P equals negative one. These go by the name KT, since there's a KT there, P is one. P equals zero is Cambridge Aachen, and P is negative one. If P is negative one, that's called anti KT, okay? Which seems kind of like a weird thing to do, but you'll see in a second why people. This turns out to be the most popular one. So you calculate all the DIJs, all the DIBs for every particle in your event. You find the smallest one, and you take those. If, if you find the smallest one, if it's an I and a J, you combine those into one particle. Okay, you combine the momentum, so the list gets small. Okay. Now, if DIB is the smallest thing, then you call the object a jet and you remove it from the list. So you keep doing this until every particle has been assigned to a jet, okay? Uh, John Way, just for completeness, there are also cone algorithms. We mentioned a few names of them in chapter nine. I know even less about these guys and they're more commonly used in E plus E minus colliders. Okay, okay, so what, I'm just gonna do that. That's a little clunky, but it, yeah, maybe, can we, you want to try something else? Yeah, sure. Let's let's open it up. Um, did I mute myself? No. What? You're not muted. Oh, okay. You, you're just.
Yeah, but they forget that active that in there. I was talking about. Uh, one thing, get back to that for one thing that might make it a little easier. Mm -hmm. is if we push this guy, and it'll probably give you a little bit more. Right. And what? Oh, yeah. Thank you. That's, I guess, clunky. Okay, can we? Okay. All right. Um, clunky it is. Uh, hopefully, just ask me to move things around if. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. Okay, so here's the KT, Cambridge Rock, and the anti KT. The thing is, because of the inverse KT weighting in the anti KT, it wants to cluster the whole most energetic particles first. And then once it does that, the soft ones, it just picks up every soft particle that's a rich R. So you see that the KT ones. I mean, all these things sort of agree on where the jets are and how much energy is in the jets. Like this, this green column and this blue column and this red column, they're all the same height, the same location. But what particles get put into one jet is a little, I mean, you get oddly shaped things that look like, I don't know what's here and here, but anti-KT sort of gives you nice circular jets and theorists like to calculate jets for, you know, with the well-defined cone size. So this is the most popular thing. So that's what's typically used. Okay. So now I can't do anything. Do I need to click it? Okay. Okay, that's good. Okay. So you see that the end point of the procedure is that like stack, right? That's selling what is the full momentum of the jet? And you know the radius because you that comes from the algorithm, right? So every jet you have has a some either a light cone momentum or a transverse momentum that corresponds to the total transverse momentum or like home momentum of that jet. And, and it has a jet radius, okay, which is chosen by either the experimentalist or the theorist. Okay. Now you can also study jet substructure. This is a huge field. Meaning you all not only have that momentum and that R, but you have a list of every particle that you put in that jet. So you can go in that jet and start computing weighted sums of functions of the momenta or energy of those individual particles. And that allows you to look inside and see what's going on inside the jet. Here's something that, uh, called angularity that is just some weighting of the P plus and P minus of um, each jet constituents. And angularities have parameter A. And for different values of A, these have special names. Like jet broadening is A equals zero. Is that or one? I can't remember. Um, but any cap A's, the, I, I don't really want to emphasize this one too much. This one might appear, will appear later in the talk. Uh, it's nice because you can calculate it pretty, uh, calculate, calculate analytically with this, this thing, but there's, there's dozens and dozens of these things. And the point is you can look inside the jet and start to weight the constituents in some way or another. Another important thing is you can get inside that jet, and we're going to be doing a lot of this today, and say, let me go look for, say, a K on or a pi on and ask what is the distribution of pions and kaons within this jet? That's called an identified hadron of the jet, and that's another form of, of jet substructure. Okay. Okay, what do jet factorization theorems look like? Okay. The other two important concepts that we have to talk about when we talk about measuring a jet is we have to talk about what we're measuring besides the jet. So there's something called inclusive jet production, right? Like say, bit smash PP, I look for a jet and I don't care what else is going on in the event. I just sum over all this, okay? When this happens, okay, the factorization, when you, when you measure something like this, this inclusive jet production, the cross-section formula you get look very similar to what you would get for inclusive hadron form production. Okay, so if you replace this with the hadron H, in collinear factorization, that's what I've written down here, you have uh, part-time distribution functions, collinear part-time distribution functions for each of the proton. 
some hard um, cross section for the, the two partons to create an energetic parton C. And then there's a jet function that describes that particle C and the collinear radiation that makes up the jet. Okay. All right. If this were inclusive hadron production, this would be a collinear fragmentation function. And because of that, um, this jet function has to be the same evolution that the fragmentation function does, so it obeys D-glide. Okay. Um, and there's one paper that has that in there. Okay. Now you can do something, and this is something that Chris has worked a lot on and I've worked a lot on. You can also consider exclusive jet production. Okay. Let's say we did E plus E minus goes to N jet. So we have one jet over here, one jet over here, and one jet over here, like maybe that picture that I showed at the beginning, and no radiation elsewhere. To calculate a cross action like that, it's very different, okay? Because you have to veto extra jets. You can't allow for a fourth jet. So you're asking the event to sort of, you're going to put a constraint on the amount of radiation that goes outside those jets, okay? So then you get a much more complicated factorization theorem. There's a hard part. Then you have sort of two types of jets. You either have jets of lower, where you just talk about the total energy in R in the jet and you don't look inside to see what's in there. Or you can have jets where you measure, say, the angularity or some substructure variable. Okay. This is a cross section for n minus n unmeasured jets and m measured jets, where in this case the measuring variable is angularity. So in the jets where you study this substructure, soft radiation can contribute. And so, so you have to have a soft function because you're vetoing on hard radiation. There's some soft radiation outside the jets. That's what this function is describing, okay? This soft function knows where each of those jets are. And then if there's a measurement of the substructure, this is there's typically a convolution of the soft function with the jet function here, okay? Now, for the unmeasured jets, they they typically they will enter the cross section multiplicatively, multipli multipli okay. And these are just two point functions of these collinear fields. And there's some measurement operator that tells you that the, all the collinear radiation has to go within some radius r, okay. And that's how you compute those things. But they're basically just functions of r and the energy of the jet. So that's kind of the background of what you need to know about jets to read chapter nine. Okay, so does anybody have questions about jets? What I've said about the factorization? Good, I think. All right, so now uh, this is the first application of jets to TMD physics and I, uh, Okay, that's good. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, uh, so this is an idea by John Bo Kang and others. Um, so the point here is this. We've done CITIS, and throughout this week, when we've talked about CITIS, we've talked about identifying a hadron in the final state. And everything we've calculated is a convolution of a TMD PDF and a TMD fragmenting function, fragmentation function. So you, when we go through this program of measuring all these fragmentation functions, all these eight fragmentation functions and all these eight uh, part-time distribution functions, we're never gonna have a cross-section in CITIS with a hadron. We're not gonna have two of those non-known functions. We're gonna have to try to disentangle what these two functions are. This gives us a process, okay, where you can calculate just in terms of a TMD fragmentation function. There's a catch, of course, but that's the kind of the motivation for this. Okay, it's an independent way of extracting a TMD. You don't need to know the fragmentation function for the final state. And they're interested in, this is described in nine point. I don't know if it's 9.1 or 9.2, 9.1, I think. Okay. Um, 
the process that they're interested in is EP collisions, and you have a hard lepton coming out of the scattering, deep elastic scattering, and that's recoiling against the jet, and these two things are back to back. Okay. And it's just like what you do in drill yan. This has a large PT, this has a large PT. If I take the difference, and the minus sign is there because they're going in the opposite direction. This is the large scale. This is like Q in ordinary, the big Q in ordinary TMD physics. This QT, which is the sum, measures the momentum and balance. So they're exactly back to back. This thing is zero. And you're measuring slight deviations from zero. And that's like the QT in draw in. Okay. So, Kang et al. described an SCT like factorization theorem. And so, since that jet is unmeasured in the sense that we only know its total PT and the R that was used to define it, okay, it just enters this, this cross section multiplicatively. And you get a standard TMD like factorization. This is the SCT like factorization where we have soft functions and beam functions. So, here's our beam function. And instead of the, the fragmentation function, we have a soft function that depends on BT. Uh, we, we separate this soft function into a global function and what's called a collinear soft function. I'm gonna explain what that split is in the next thing. Okay, next slide. Then we can do the same thing we did in, 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 in CITIS. We can take our global guy, where it is the square root S and N. This is the same square root function that we needed to combine with the B to get the TEM DPEF. And so then what we get is, this is the mismatch between this guy and this guy. And so then after we account for that mismatch, this is our factorization there. We have the TEM DPEF and we have some soft function which depends on BT and it's been factorized into two pieces, which I'll now explain. Okay. So, so this is just like CIDES, except instead of having a TMD fragmentation function, involved against the, the TMD PDF, we have this soft function, which is BT dependent. Okay. All right. Some of the elements that went into that factorization. Um, JQ describes energetic particles collinear to the jet. S global describes soft radiation over all of phase space. SCS describes soft radiation to collinear to the jet. Collinear to the jet. And the reason you have these two guys is nicely explained in the paper by Chen, uh, Horning, and Lee. The basic idea, this is for, this diagram is lifted from their paper. They were studying digit events, but the concept is the same. If I have a soft function that's supposed to describe all the radiation outside of the jet, okay, then that's, so this is like, this is just the momentum of one gluon, say, being emitted, then, the soft function would describe, would be, place a cut on radiation outside the two gi jets in a di jet event, okay? And what they observed is you can write this, this soft function, which is considering this phase space as a soft function, which covers all of phase space, minus some soft collinear function, which describes radiation inside the jet, okay? And that soft collinear radiation, it's called soft collinear because it's collinear to the jet, but it's soft scaling of the momentum, okay? And that's just what that factorization is all about. Um, that's my best artwork. Yeah, this was the best figure in any paper because your paper was long and complicated to understand. And then I started getting to it and I got to about page five, you know how you read papers, you read the abstract, you read half the introduction, you start flipping through the equations. I got to this figure, I'm like, this is the entire point that's of the paper. That's the whole paper. You can write a paper for that, that diagram. That, that picture is my greatest discovery. <laughs> oh, you have some other discoveries. Didn't you like, oh, we can, we can do that later. When I get a chance to embarrass you, I will definitely do that. Okay, so this is the application of that formula by Andre and all. And you know, it seems to describe the QT dependence measured at H1 very well. It's kind of interesting because, uh, okay, so what these are, did, these are all kinds of Monte Carlo that people like to use to describe the data. That's pretty neat. Um, here's the black dots that are almost hard to see because they put so many Monte Carlos in there of the other data. The red is what you do if you do NLO with a little bit of modeling of non-perturbative physics. 
And actually you can see that the TMD distribution, not surprisingly works a little bit better, especially at low QT. So there's some evidence that this factorization works. Um, I'll mention in passing that you can also try to do this for the Seiger's asymmetry, just put a polarized TMD PDF. Okay, so this is a polarized form. And you can look at the azimuth modification that is the signal of Seiger's. Um, what you learn from this plot is that the theory uncertainty is huge. No one's measured this, I don't think. Okay. But the projected uncertainties, which you're sitting down here because there's no data, but they can project the uncertainties from the EIC or orders of magnitude, it looks like smaller than this theory band. So somebody needs to get this theory band smaller by the time the EIC rolls around, maybe you want to do that as part of your thesis work or something. Okay. All right. Now this is something we'll be talking about a great deal. Let me make sure this phone call is not important. Spam risk. That's Sivers telling you to pronounce his name correctly. Okay, Sivers, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Good joke. All right, so, so the next thing we're going to talk about, which is the subject of 9.2, is uh, jets with identified hadrons. All right, so this is a cartoon that's from the... Um, <clears throat> from the handbook. I don't know what paper it was taken from, but it's in the handbook. The idea is you have a quark, it initiates a jet, it maybe has some collinear radiation outside that jet, but eventually it forms a jet. And then you find some hadron inside the jet. Okay, and you look at the distribution. The cross section is a function of the location of the hadron within the jet. All right, and so let me just declare the variables that you could study. Let's say you're doing inclusive jet production. So if you're doing inclusive jet production, there's nothing wrong with this cork sort of setting off some collinear gluon that doesn't end up in the jet, giving it some and, and giving up some energy and then hadronizing into the jet. Okay. If that happens, then there's two Z's in this problem. There's the ratio of the jet energy to the energy of the parts on that initiated that jet. There's a ZH, which is the ratio of the hadron energy to the energy of the jet, okay? And then you can even measure the transverse momentum distribution inside the jet, okay? Um, if you do exclusive jet production, meaning like you cast for a two, like a die jet event, you put a veto on collinear radiation outside those two jets, so there's some soft veto, then this has to be one because soft radiation, it can, these gluons can go soft, but then they should, then the energy of the jet should be the same as the energy of the initial core, initiating core. So then this is Z variables one, and the relevant variables are ZH and JT. So in the ex exclusive jet, you, you have a longitudinal fraction and a transverse momentum that you can trust studying. Okay. All right. Do I have to, I have to click. Now, uh, oh, I think I'm doing all right. Scream if I'm not. Um, okay, so this is the most general thing where we measure ZH, JT. There's also a Z here. I don't know. Okay, I think that's what the ZC is. But um, again, this is an inclusive cross section because we're measuring jet identified hadron in X. Oh, that really was servers, all right. Um, so, so all that happens is we take the jet function that was in the old fact factorization theorem and we replace it with something called a fragmented jet function, which is this calligraphic J, cal calligraphic G. It depends on the hadron, it depends on all these variables. And if, uh, depending on whether, if we're measuring PT, it'll depend on this, you know, this uh, columns var variable. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we have various options here, inclusive, exclusive. Uh, do you measure just the ZH or do you measure PT as well? 
And so I'll just gonna run through the various scenarios that we, we consider, all right? Okay, so if you have an inclusive jet production, then, but you only measure the longi longitudinal momentum fraction, you're gonna have dependence on Z, dependence on ZH, but not JT, because you've integrated over that. And it's gonna obey a de Glock-like equation. Now, what makes these functions really interesting, they have a couple of important features, but the most important one for us is this. This function, okay, can be matched onto the fragmentation function that appears in inclusive hadron production. So these would be the collinear fragmentation functions that you would want to know if you were calculating the um, just the cross section for producing the hadron H. All right, they're related by a perturbative matching coefficient. This is a perturbative series in alpha s, this J inclusive, this curly J inclusive. And so measuring these distributions of hadrons within jets can actually tell us something about fragmentation functions. In this case, collinear fragmentation functions. Okay. If we have an exclusive jet production, so we're doing like an N jet cross section, we peer inside one of those jets and look for a hadron. Now this thing is going to be this thing is going to evolve more like a jet function. There's going to be an equation like this is what the jet function obeys, and the anomalous dimension is the same as the jet function. And again, in this case, we can match this guy onto a collinear fragmentation function. This matching coefficient is different than the one before. So the matching coefficient is different, but it still contains information about the collinear fragmentation function. That's a really important point when we get to Corvignon. Here I go. What? Okay. If you got both ZH and JT measured in the, the, uh, in the jet. So we, we go inside the jet, we find our hadron of interest, we measure its longitudinal momentum pressure and its PT, which I'm calling JT, which I don't really like, but that's what they call it in the camera. Um, then that's the most complicated scenario. And it, they, they go through a number of arguments. This isn't quite so obvious, but it turns out that this guy is also related to the TMD fragmentation function, okay, times some multiplicative matching coefficient, okay? Since it's TMD factorization, we don't have de Glapp involution, so we don't have a convolution. There. Uh, the de Glapp, if it's inclusive, this will, will be de Glapp evolution. If it's exclusive, it's more like a jet. Okay, but the, the main story here is that these identified, these fragmenting jet functions, which describe hadrons within jets, are related to either the collinear or TMD PDF, TMD fragmentation functions that we've been interested in studying all week. And so they fought these observables where we look at jets and look at hadrons and some give us alternative ways of studying those functions. Okay, so. I'm now going to get to Jets with Corbin, but I want to stop here and take some questions. So, as, yeah, go ahead. Uh, what was the gamma cusp? What does that mean? Uh, so that I gamma know. cusp is that gamma cusp has appeared several times. And um, when you do the inclusive jet production, it appears in the TMD evolution. You have these. Um, I know I'm going to learn how to do this. Okay. So typically, if you look, if you look at like Peskin's textbook and he talks about anomalous dimensions, he talks about anomalous dimensions for operators, right? And they're all they always look like this. Okay. Just some function alpha s. So when you look at normalize the quark mass or something, there's a gamma n. Okay. Now when you start renormalizing these non-local objects with Wilson lines in them. You get funkier things, okay? Because you're look, you're not looking at a local operator anymore. You're looking at something with Wilson lines, and things are separated. And okay, all right. Now, if you have a straight Wilson line and you renormalize it with perturbation theory, it's, let's say it's light-like, then nothing can happen because any every vertex out of that Wilson line has a light-like vector, which which with contracting with another light-like vector gives zero. 
So if I have light like Wilson lines, and I want to get anything to happen at all, I have to have two of them, and I have to have them meet at a point so there's a kink, okay? And if you compute the anomalous dimension for that kink or cusp, that is, so if you want to compute the anomalous dimension for Wilson lines that intersect like that, you will find this cusp times the logarithm in the example I'm giving you, it's going to depend on something related to the angle between those Wilson lines, okay? So that's where the terminology cusp comes from. In general, when you see TMD evolution, or these uh, evolution equations for jets, okay, and soft functions in the in exclusive factorization theorems, you will also see these anomal anomalous dimensions that have logarithms. And what always multiplies the logarithm is this gamma cuts. So it's a very universal quantity. So this has appeared, this has appeared multiple times. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, this is small. Uh, so you were talking about these from exclusive jets. Is that in the minimum number of tests you're, you're uh, doing? Yes, yes. If I do an exclusive cross section, I look at jets, I look at a jet, but I don't ask any questions about are there two jets in that event, and three jets in that event, what is the radiation out there doing? You're not asking any of those questions. Okay, that's what it, it, inclusive means. In exclusive, like for instance, they'll do measurements of the, what, there are extractions of alpha s that want to measure something called thrust. Okay, they want to be close to the digit limit. So they're looking for a situation where we have a ton of particles going this way and a ton of particles going this way, and only soft radiation and very low energy outside those two jets. And I'm making a specific restriction that I don't have any energetic particles going anywhere but my two jets that I'm looking at. That's an inclusive. Did I say that right? That's an exclusive measurement. And there, you don't need to just know what's going on with jets. You need to know that you're restricting the soft radiation outside of those jets. And that's why you have this little complex factorization theorem where you have a jet function, a jet function, and some soft functions in there. And does that answer your question? Excellent. Yeah. Is there a question? Sorry, go ahead. Uh, she has a question. So when you do the uh, jet with identified electrons, uh, you can get both the collinear FF and the TMDF. Yeah, depending on what you measure. measure. Um, in the previous case where you um, do the EP collision, measuring one jet and one electron, I think you only talked about measuring TMD to the uh, Can you measure collinear PDF in that case? If, if you, what you would have to do then, um, well, we wanted to measure the TMD. PDFs, so we define an observable that was sensitive to the small QT of balance. Mm -hmm. You could have a collinear factorization theorem for a jet and a lepton, and that would be sensitive to collinear. Okay, so I didn't bring that up because we're not interested in that, okay. but, but you can fine. you can do that. I bet Chris has calculated that. I mean, right. I mean, probably. <laughs> <laughs> probably. Yeah, depends on what you measure. Okay. okay. Just want to make a small comment on the next slide. Yeah. Did I say something wrong? No, no. Just wanted to clarify. Ugh. How's it that I'm not? Oh. Okay, I, I got to use a lighter touch. Okay. No, it's my. It's the same one. Okay. And don't push down on the scroll. I, I push you too hard. I, I, I realize if I do a wider touch. Yeah, don't push it down. It's, anyway, um, the G on the middle line and the T on the last line, they're, they're two different functions. They're, they're not the same function. That's why they convey different energies. Yeah. Because one's inclusive and one's exclusive. If you're inclusive, you almost have to be black. Because if you think about the friend, if you think about a factorization theorem for Inclusive hadron production, it's always, you know, collinear PDF involved with collinear fragmentation function. We know that the collinear fragmentation function obeys a de Black equation. Um, yeah, if you're exclusive, then something else happens. It's more like a jet function. I, I think I'm saying that right. 
Okay, there you go. I'm getting it. I'm getting it. All right, how am I doing for the time? Keep going. Yeah, I have to think that's kind of where I wanted to be actually. Okay, so this is the second half of my talk. This is a research program that me and collaborators and other people have been doing for a few years now. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> this is the main point of it. So we have all this technology for studying hadrons within jets. And we said that those functions were could be matched onto collinear and TMD fragmentation functions, depending on what we want to calculate, okay? Now, for light hadrons, we can match onto those, but we can't calculate them, right? Do we have to get some experimental input to get a, a TMD or a collinear fragmentation function? Heavy quark ionia are qualitatively different. The, the main FOX space of the state, if you will, is a heavy quark and anti quark pair. And it turns out, and so these are bound states with quarks that, whose masses are much bigger than lambda QCD. And that means that there's a large scale that you might hope that in some sense you can calculate the fragmentation function from first principles. Okay. So that's what makes them a little bit more interesting because we could you know, take the G's, the P's identified hadrons with jets match them onto fragmentation functions and then try to calculate those from NRQCD, okay? So one, for Corgonia, you could conceivably have more predictive power. Also, as I'll explain, Corgonia production has actually kind of been poorly understood for quite some time. I mean, we kind of get it and kind of don't. I'll, I'll review that theory in what follows. That's why we're gonna spend 45 minutes on this topic. So, we were interested in this because these looking at Corconia within jets, as opposed to looking at inclusive production of Corconia. So almost all measurements of Corconia colliders are inclusive. You calculate PP goes to J psi plus X. Well, some things that they've also tried to compute for say double J psi production, where you get two size plus X, or you might, another interesting thing is to calculate J psi production, recalling against the heavy, uh, an energetic photon or Z particle. But there are always these kind of inclusive measurements. No one had really thought to look inside a jet for Corgonia. Okay. And so that was our idea, basically. And that's how I got interested in this subject. Oh, uh, there we go again. Uh, I, I got to be on the thing, right? How is I'm looking over my shoulder? Okay. So this is the outline for this subsection of the talk. We're going to talk about NRQCD corporal production. We're going to review that. That's kind of an interesting story in and of itself. I don't know how many people, how many people have worked on corporal production. Okay, so a few of you have. And some of you have not, so you've learned something there. Then this is the central idea that heavy corporal fragment, fragmented jet functions can be calculated in NRQCD. Uh, and recently they actually did a measurement that was motivated by our work. So I'll show you that recent data. Then I have some comments about what's gonna um, happen next. Okay. All right, so now we gotta go way back and think about how you calculate the production of Corconia. All right, and this is gonna be a very fast review, but the way that people calculated color signal model, 1995, that's when I was in grad school, okay? People were still doing calculations like this. People still occasionally do calculations like this. I want to calculate the production of a J psi. Well, J psi is a heavy quark anti quark pair. So it's like a trauma, like a positronium, right? So how do you calculate positronium decays in Peskin's textbook? All right. You calculate E plus E minus at rest decays to two photon, and then you multiply that by the wave function at the origin for the bound state. All right. So that's what they did. Seems reasonable. Seems like what I would do with the trium. Take the cross section for glue, 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 glue goes to CC bar. Well, this J psi is a color singlet, so we better make that CC bar a color singlet. This J psi has spin one, so we better tie these spins together so it has three as one. Then we're going to multiply by some wave function the origin squared. Boom, this is like a homework problem, right? This is easy stuff. Okay, this is how you calculated positronium decay in chapter four of Pessimist's book. All right. Okay, this is great. It's predictive formalism. This we get this one number, 
So instead of the leptonic decay of the J sine, we can cap that anything we want. Now, there were some signs that this was not going to be the whole story with QCD. People tried to calculate, say, P wave decays to hadrons and found that they didn't even get infrared safe cross sections when they used this wave function of the origin model. But the real thing that got everybody to rethink how you calculate a J psi pro, J psi cross section, is that this J psi model cracked out at the LHC in 1996. Okay. And here's this is a very old plot. But um, here are the data points. So I should say in passing that a key thing was the reason that they didn't see this problem until 1996 is that the overwhelming majority of J side that are produced at the Tevatron are produced in the decay of B mesons. It's kind of surprising, but it's true. Okay. So this, what, the, what I'm calculating here is the direct production of J side. Meaning it doesn't go through, it, you don't produce a B meson, wait for it to K, and that's how you, you say, produce it in the hard collision. Okay, that's direct J psi production. The way you separate these J psi from all those J psi that come from B mesons is to use a silicon vertex detector to tell you that this J psi came from the interaction point, not a whole Fermi away where it clearly came from the decay of the B meson. Okay, excuse me. Yeah. He's, he's, Okay, so in in modern um, collider experiments, you have the beam, and the the innermost detector is a bunch of cylindrical sheets of um, silicon that track, and so that allows you to, to track where the particles came from. And these are like what are what are these? They they they're like CCDs almost. I mean, they're just silicon. So here's I'm just I guess I'm confused. How does that how would that make the difference between the J side versus so we produce a B meson? How how long do they live? Picosecond. So your B meson, if you produce a B meson, that that B cork is produced, and that B meson propagates along for like a micron. I, I don't know the weight scale off the top of my head, but it's not very long, but it's definitely not zero. And so all your B meson decay products point to somewhere else, which isn't where the proton hit. So here's my proton and anti-proton hitting. So and that's then, when you can distinguish to the J side. Yeah. Okay, sorry, thank you. That's the okay, that was kind of fun to tell. Um, okay. So here's the leading order color signal model, way below the data. This is a log plot, so this discrepancy is monstrous. There's this thing that I, I can't see here, maybe you can see it. I, I could barely see it, but there's some sort of fragmentation extension of the color signal model that improves the shape, but not the normalization. And so that's when um, about that time, people had invented something called the NRPC factorization formula. These people actually developed it to kind of deal with that, that problem I mentioned earlier with the decays not being infrared safe. Okay. And so I don't have the time to review NRPCD or the factorization formulas or anything. I'll just tell you what comes out of the analysis. My cross section, when I calculate the J psi production, I calculate two C of C to C bar being produced. But instead of demanding that they have the same quantum numbers as the J psi, I allow them to have any quantum numbers they want. Okay. They can be in a color signal triplet state, like in the color signal model, but they can also be in other configurations that are, say, in a color octet 3s1, a color octet 1s0, or a color octet 3pj. Okay. So they have different angle momentum and color quantum numbers. And what keeps this summation from going on and on to infinity is like the standard thing in respect to field theories that Duff was talking about. You have to have a power counter in your loss. We don't have a power counting. This, this idea means that there's an infinite number of terms. 
Tack on something else. Okay, but we do have a power counting in NRQCD. So it's a double expansion alpha S V. V is the relative velocity of the corconium in the bound state. And these matrix on the, it turns out, you know, I don't have time to, to, to um to teach you how to calculate these things. This one you could guess from saying this is the wave function of the origin squared, roughly. So uh that goes like V cubed. And all these ones that have the wrong quantum numbers that don't match the J side, they're the color octet operators, they're down by V to the fourth relative to the lead one. Okay. So if you want to learn how to count these Vs, you can read this paper, but don't read the errata because it's confusing. It makes no sense. <laughs> also, their papers by Luke Van Hart and um, Rossi that do a good job of explaining the accounting. All right, so this is all just facts, but now we have new mechanisms. So if we have new mechanisms, we can try to fix that mess we saw on the last slide. Um, and that that is how that got fixed. That's what Sean and Eric figured out. They figured out if you add a color octet, you can naturally explain this. And that, and, and a, a key thing there is we had those velocity scaling rules, right? So you might say, oh, glue glue goes to octet CC bar. I have this new matrix on it. I can make it whatever I want. The cross section is as big as I want. And that's true, except you have to be consistent with the velocity scaling rules. And they actually found that the car tech matrix element they needed to fix this mess was roughly the size, maybe even smaller than what those velocity scaling rules tell you. So, so that happened. And then everybody got excited to calculate the color mechanism to every, it was a great time when I was in grad school. You can publish a paper doing a tree level cross section. Like now to do something in our field, you got to go to N, N cubed LL resummed with it. And, and <laughs> never would have gotten my PhD if I'd had to do that. But at the time you just do leading order color that mechanism, see what happened, okay? So many years have gone by. We now have next leading order calculations. People have done global fits with NLO color system model and color octet map matrix elements with those four matrix elements that I showed you. And the story is okay. I mean, this I that was just to show you that there's a lot of data. You know, zoom in on two processes. This is the calculation of, of, of JSI production, inclusive JSI production in EP. This is all done in collinear factorization. Okay. And you kind of see this pattern a lot if you stare at the, the things on the upper in the previous slide, which kind of won't go away. Oh, all right. You know, leading order color octet doesn't quite do it. Next leading order color octet or color sigma doesn't do it. You put the color octet, you do a lot better. Okay. That's true for most of the slides, most of the graphs I showed you on the last thing. Not everywhere, there are processes that. NLO NRQC kind of under predicts here. What is the status of this? You need these color octet mechanisms to explain most of the data. There are cases where the color octet or the color signal fits, particularly A to C production, which is not on those slides that those graphs that I showed you earlier. A to C production right now, as I understand it, the color system model works well. And if you use heavy quark symmetry to try to predict what the color octet is, you over predict it. So it's not perfect, there are problems, okay? I didn't list that here, but I, that's an example of one. But the chi square degree of freedom for JSI production is bigger than you'd like. The matrix elements come out to be suppressed by about a factor of 100, which is consistent with that V to the fourth suppression, maybe even smaller. The big problem, one of the big problems is. If I take the LVMEs from the global fits, you get a prediction for the polarization of J psi that's way off. And this is an outstanding puzzle in the field. People have thought of ways of fixing it, but the way they fix it is to simply ignore some of the data and just focus on the highest PT data and argue that QCD factorization only works there, which is not really very satisfying, but it might be the case. Um, and I'm just gonna skip that. Um, so this is an example of one paper. Bodwin and all, they did kind of a, they worked in the fragmentation approximation 
only refuse, refuse to calculate JSI production below PT of 10, because Bobo doesn't think NRPC works unless the PT is much higher than it, the mass of the JSI. Then he, he does some resumming using deep lab evolution. And he can, he can describe the high PT data and get zero polarization. The way he does it is basically the 1s0 octet matrix only. If the CC bar is produced in a 1s0 state, you're obviously not going to get any polarization. So if you do a fit where that dominates, you're going to get this right. And that's what he does. But his, his matrix elements are inconsistent with these global fits. So we now have this problem that you know, what really are the matrix elements? So, so one thing that I got interested in this concluding with the JETS thing was to try and figure out whether this would give us an independent way of studying these matrix elements, extracting these matrix elements at high energy, okay? By looking at jets with, with coconut. All right, and whoa, what happened there? I don't even wanna talk about that stuff. These are my backup slides. Oh God. Oh no no no! I just went fifty pages. Yeah, let me keep stopping it, and then I'll scroll with the touchpad. Yeah, can you do that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, great, great. Uh, keep going, keep going, keep going. Ooh, keep going, keep going. Stop, stop, stop. Go back down. <laughs> go get back down. Okay, that's what we were on. Skip that and go to NRPCD fragmentation functions. Up, no, no, up, 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 up. This one, this one, this one. Okay, make a good again. Thank you very much, Andrew. Okay, so the idea in the late 90s, long before SCT, jets, and fragmented jet functions, was that the fragmentation function, those Ds, the notation I'm using is slightly different than what I was using earlier because I'm lifting it from old papers. But, but anyhow, the, the gluon to JSI fragmentation function could be calculated at leading order. Here's just a delta function in terms of these matrix elements. Do you have a question? Or? Okay. Um, here, if you do 3s1, this, this fragmentation function is trivial because the, you can have a gluon going directly to a CC bar that I mean, this is nothing. But you can get, if you, if you take this diagram and add two gluons to it, you can have a gluon fragmenting via the 3s1 mechanism, the color singlet mechanism, and it multiplies the function of z that's calculable. And unfortunately, it's a big mess, but at least you can stick this into mathematic and plot it. So the whole idea about fragmentation functions, you want to calculate, you know, the z dependence of the fragmentation function, right? Okay, so the z dependence here is calculable. Of course, to set the normalization for each of these contributions, we need to know these anarchistic matrix elements. That's the idea that Broughton had in the 90s. So you combine Broughton's idea in the 90s, these are all his students and postdocs, so that's why it's, it's his idea, it's their idea really. But um, you combine that idea from the 90s with the fragmentation, uh, fragmented jet function, and you can try to make predictions for them using NRQCD. Okay. So remember I told you earlier that these fragmentation functions, these fragmenting jet functions, so for a while, I'm only going to be talking about the ones that depend on Z, not the PT dependent ones. I'm going to slip something in there about them at the very end of the talk. Um, you can, you can, I said earlier that you can take a fragmented jet function and match it onto um, a fragmentation function, right? Do people remember that from the first part? Okay. So the, the leading matching, the leading order in the matching calculation is one. So it's really the fragmentation function plus order alpha s corrections, okay? Which I wrote here and are quite complicated looking. The important thing is this is alpha s is suppressed. And when you look at these logarithms, the logarithms are really minimized at two e tan r over two, which roughly speaking is the invariant mass of the jet, okay? And therefore, to first order an alpha s, if I, want to, if I want to neglect these terms, then I got to make all these logarithms small. I do that by choosing the scale of mu to be of order 2 e tangent r over 2. And then what I learn is that the fragmenting jet function is just 
the, the fermentation function evaluated at the 2e tangent r over 2 scale. Now, when we did this calculation down here in the earlier, the only scale in the problem when I calculate the fragmentation function is, is 2mc, right? Because there's no, there's nothing else, right? So the appropriate normalization scale for these guys is mu equals 2mc when I do this calculation. But these guys are fragmentation functions, they're collinear fragmentation functions, they obey d glap equations. So I can calculate them at the scale 2mc. Well, I don't calculate them, somebody else calculated them. But I look them up <laughs> and then I, I write a code that does d glap evolution. And I evolve these, d, these things up to the jet energy scale, which could be much larger than 2mc. And that's my prediction for the, the fragmented jet function. Okay. Well, this is a non trivial Z distribution. No, no, no this is a renormalization scale. Okay, so, so, so you can use this in a much more, you can have a, a, a gluon that has 90 GPB energy. And then use this fragmentation function to calculate this convolve back to get, calculate the distribution of J So this is this is nothing about the energy at which this thing is produced. Okay. Right. But the normalization scale is 2 C. But the, now to, to get rid of large logarithms, you're you're gonna want to evolve this up to that scale. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, so you can just plug all that No, no, no. Hmm. I mean, in this case, in this really trivial one here, it, it kind of is because this, I mean, but not here. You have extra gluons that can be energetic. So, so if, if you put two more gluons out here, and they have a significant fraction of the energy, then the initial gluon is going to have much higher than two of them. So, so 2MC is not the energy of this gluon, except in this particular case, but, but um, it could be anything. Okay. All right, so you do that exercise, calculating all these fragmentation functions at the scale 2MC, evolving them up to the jet energy scale. And I don't know, because I didn't write it on this slide, what E or R are. But there's supposed to be some much higher energy scale. And you can see that all these mechanisms, they have wildly different dependence on, on, on the matrix on it. So there's discriminating power between the various NRQCD matrices if we try to calculate these functions the way I described. All right. Um, okay, I have lots of plots that, oh, you know what? These are the way that these things look at the scale 2MC. You see how 3S1, 8 here is a delta function? So at, at, at 2MC, they're different. When you deglap evolve them up to the jet energy scale, that erases a lot of the differences, right? Because you know this delta function is instantly going to be spread out by a deglap evolution, right? So so but 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 they still have different boundary conditions for the deglap evolution. So when you run them up to some high energy scale. You see, you see very different shapes. So it's been so long since I've given this talk, I have to look at my own slides to figure out, okay, the purple is like a C quark fragmentation function. That jet fun that fragmented jet function is a rising function. This one, blue one is falling. And they just have different shapes and different normalizations. So there's something we can do here. Even when we run up to the jet energy scale, uh, they have different Z dependence. So what is this? This is, oh, here I'm plotting, I'm fixing E and I'm plotting Z. You can also try to fix Z and plot E. And there's actually, for low Z, some of these guys are rising. For high Z, 0.5 to 0.8, the one is zero contribution turns over and starts decreasing. It behaves qualitatively different than the other ones. Remember the one is zero one was the one that we wanted to dominate to fix the polarization problem. So if that's really the answer, 
there's a qualitative prediction that that should make about this how, how the this this functional dependence. Okay, how am I doing for time? Yeah, um, 30, 30, 30 minutes left. Oh, I'm not going to be able to fill all 30 minutes. That's good. We'll have 20 questions. questions. Yeah. Questions. At least I'm not like, okay, but I have about 10, 15 minutes of more things to say. I just want to know how much I need to rush through all this so I can take my time. All right. So, not so long ago, 2017, and this measurement was motivated by our work. <clears throat> um, the LHC collaboration measured something similar to what I'm talking about. It's not exactly the same. Um, but uh, they looked at jets, they put a certain cuts on jets, PT, certain um, cuts on the jet rapidity. Um, this is a cut on the muons that they used to find the JSI. But then they tried to measure the fraction of the PT of the jet that the JSI had. So in all that discussion on the last two things, I was talking about the energy of the jet and the fraction of the energy carried by the JSI. That would be more appropriate for an E plus E minus collider. In fact, in a lot of our early studies, that's what we did. But for a Hadron Collider, they measure everything's a function of PT. So they measured the PT of their jets, the PT of the JSI, and made a distribution of the Z dependence. Okay. So one thing that's going on here is, you see, it's, it's vanishing as Z goes to one, it goes up, 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 and then turns over like this. This turning over is actually a consequence of this PT cut. Because if you have a 25 GeV and your Z is 0.2, you're down at very low momentum already, and your, your muons aren't going to have very much momentum. And so the, this, the shape here is in part, especially at low Z, is really kind of a consequence of this cut that they put in their data. Okay? So you're not going to be able to directly compare what we did to this data. So they didn't do that. They didn't pay attention to this. Okay? What they did do, is they ran it against Pythia. So this is leading order NRQCD, but they did Pythia. There's, there's Pythia in this thing here. And what they found is, even though it says, um, even though it says leading order NRQCD, this is, what they mean is they, that, that Pythia default has like a um, JSI production in it. And, and within the Pythia Monte Carlo was calculated next leading order. And, and, and what they found is that Pythia did not do a very good job of describing this, which is kind of interesting because it's actually something that we predicted would happen. Okay. So in a study with my grad students, Lynn Dye, who's a graduate student of Adam Leibovich, and Andrew Hornet, who was a postdoc here, and Andrew Leibovich, um, here meeting Lano at the time. We sort of did some studies of B corks fragmenting to B jets and gluons fragmenting to J psi jets to kind of test our formalism. What we wanted to do was sort of run it through these analytical resum calculations, but I'm going to show you what they look like and compare them to Pythia to just see what, you know, what's going on. Like, does our formalism make sense? Does it, does it describe things well? Right. And we were running E plus E minus at some, I mean, we ultimately wanted to do LHC physics, right? But you don't want to start out with hadrons. It just complicates things, right? And so, so we did it with E plus E minus at some scale that no experiment in the world is doing, but we were trying to do it at energies of LHC and just compare it with Pythia. All right. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Okay, all that stuff I've said earlier. So, so we would either have a factorization theorem with a cork and anti-cork and a gluon, and then stick our our our, our, our uh, fragmenting jet function in there for J psi, or we do, we would do something like QQ bar and have a, a BB or BB bar and have a B fragmenting to a B meson, and we just wanted to see how we did. Measure and we add angularity was the jet substructure we're interested in. I've already told you about the difference between unmeasured and measured jets. So, using generalizations of formulas for jet cross sections that are in the paper by Chris Lee that I mentioned earlier, you can derive resummed 
cross section. So this would be for like, um, so this would be for a two jet event. This would be something that you would write down for like BB bar followed by B fragmenting to B mesons. And you see the fragmentation function there. You see all this soft and jets and all this jazz here is from doing evolution. And it's, it's not pretty to look at, but it's, it's useful. And another thing, just to do numerical comparisons with numerical methods, we said MADGRAPH versus Pythia. Um, and, okay, so we, we did it two ways, analytically and, and, um, and uh, numerically. And I don't know why, but these guys always, the JET people, the SCT people always did this. They would derive these resub formulas and then they'll go like test it against Monte Carlo to see how well they agreed. And that was good also for, because you can turn off and turn on hydrogenization effects. So if you, if you think that, you know, your resub calculation agrees pretty well with the, the Pythia with the hydrogenization turned off, then you can get a sense of what hydrogenization is going to do to your analytic formula because that's not in there. Stuff like that. Okay, so... Bands are theory predictions with um, theoretical errors. Dashes are Pythia simulations with no errors. And here we calculated um, fixed Z variable tau not. Tau not is one of the angularities. Okay. Um, the other thing we were interested in is whether this could discriminate for various um, different matrix elements. So orange here is 3s1. Octet and green is one is zero octet. Um, so when we ran our when we did our analytic calculations against Pythia, we found that they looked nothing alike. Okay, and so that was kind of so that's why I said we thought we could have predicted what the LHCB people saw because you know the data kind of went down in that calculation and. And it went over the data at the high Z region. And, and what you see in all these calculations here is that Pythia is predicting many more JSI at large Z than um, um, my, our analytic calculations did. And the reason that is, is because Pythia has like a very weird model for calculating the showering. So, so what Pythia does, if it produces a color signal JSI, that JSI just goes off. It never has to do anything because it doesn't, there's no color string associated to the JSI and Pythia if it's producing a color signal state. So when these people, when, when NRQCD people um, came up with these color octet mechanisms, the Pythia people had to, well, what do we do with this, right? Because in, in, a, in a Pythia simulation, you have to keep track of color globally throughout the whole event, all right? So they had some picture where this color octet CC bar pair would sort of stay intact and it would split off some gluons down to, to, to some energy and it had some funny choice of splitting functions. But if you think about what our calculation does, what did we do? We calculated the fragmentation function at 2MC and then we ran out with DGLAP to the high energy scale. Okay, which is sort of the reverse. So, so this is the inverse of that. What, what we're doing is we would take a high energy gluon, okay, and allow them to split gluons until its invariant mass is around 2MC, okay, and then we would evolve that with a perturbative NRQCD fragmentation function. That's kind of the inverse. That's, that's the Pythia version of what we were doing in our analytic formula, okay? So, so we had some method that had this awful acronym GFIP that basically we produced a hard gluon and literally showered it down to the scale 2MC, stopped it 2MC and convoluted manually with our NRPC fragmentation functions. And if you do that, okay, that actually agrees quite well with our next leading log calculation. So what we concluded basically was that Pythia did not really handle the gluon radiation off these octet pairs correctly. And then if the experiment came out, it seemed to verify what we were saying. Okay. Um, so we did an analysis of, um, we tried to do an analysis of the LHCB data and see what we could learn from it. 
Um, this was again with the people, same group of people. Um, it was important just from looking at, this is from some simulation. It turns out there's lots of glue at the top, at, at, at the LHC. But there's lots of charm, okay? And that charm comes out with much harder energy. And so if we're gonna do high energy JSI production within jets, we're gonna to have to account for charm port fragmentation as well as gluon fragmentation. Um, so uh, here are three sets of data. Here are three extractions of, this is the important part of the phenomenology. So I showed you earlier those global fits to JSI production data. And those are the ones that kind of had a good fit to the global data, but to get the polarization right. This, these are their numbers. That's uh, Hugh and Sean and Neil um, are these guys. These two are, are guys that are, are analysis where they just focus on very high energy and ignore more energy data. And these are the kinds of matrix elements that their analysis spit out. One important thing is that this P wave is negative for these guys and positive for these guys. And the one at zero is much bigger. Okay. Um, so there's a bunch of words. Um, basically, we generated hard events by using MADRAF. Okay. We did this thing where we took the NRQC fragmentation functions and evolved them from 2MC to the jet energy scale. We don't have a complete factorization theorem. This would be what you get if you took the soft function and set it to one. If we didn't even do resubmission, we just had this d glap evolution, okay? Um, but if you're only interested in the Z dependence, the fragment and jet functions are the only thing that big factorization theorem that knows about Z. So having the wrong soft function doesn't really matter as far as if we just don't want to calculate the Z distribution, right? Okay. So what we found is that when we use these matrix elements from the people that focus on high energies, we got pretty good agreement. We either, we either use the fragmenting jet function, we create the fragmenting jet function by taking the energy functions and involving them the jet energy scale, and then you know, using numerical methods to put that in a simulation where a gluon or chunk could be created. Or we could do that calculation with this um, numerical way of modifying Pythia that we thought gave better agreement. Both those methods are consistent. I would take the fragment and jet function calculation more seriously. Okay, and so those LDMEs extracted from high energy fits seem to agree with the LHC data on quarkonium within jets. But when we do the, um, when we do it with the matrix elements for um, from the global fits, it just doesn't look as good. It over predicts it at high Z, it under predicts it at low Z. The errors are significantly smaller here because those guys fit to the world's data. So these all the data. And these guys up on the previous slide are, um, only fit to a subset of the data. So their statistical errors on their extracted matrix elements are, are uh, larger. Okay. All right, so that's about, okay. Th so that's, here's some future things like Kang and, and John Way and his, his collaborators have looked at uh, polarization j sine jets. Nobody's measured the polarization. There's a number of other things we could try and calculate. Since this is a TMD calculate conference, I wanna say that there's a little bit of work on uh, you know, we said we could have a fragmenting jet function where we measure not only the longitudinal fraction Z, but also the PT relative to the jet axis. And so that's never been measured, okay? When, we, when I was talking about PT in, in the experimental, that was PT relative to the V, okay? But this is PT within the jet. And so we played around with this and used the TMD formulation formalism that we've been talking about all week to calculate this. We were kind of naive. So you know how everybody this week has been talking about how you have to sort of, for large B, you have to turn off the B, replace it with a B star and add some non-perturbative, either the negative B with a phenological parameter to get something sensible. We just did straight perturbative resummation. 
and just wanted to see if out here at large PT, you can see a difference. And in some cases, you can see a very clear difference in the peaks and the normalization, et cetera. Like to, so we were looking at extremely high PT. I can't imagine how big a jet you have to have to have a transverse momentum of 10 within the jet. But anyhow, we were just playing around, wanting to see if that PT distribution of JSI within jet could tell you something about the production mechanism. It appears that it could, but this hasn't been measured. And the theory needs to be fixed up a little bit and done more properly. So, but that was fun. It was the first TMD calculation I ever did. Um, we had some other observables. This is the fragmentation function. Um, you can't really believe it as z goes to one or z goes to zero. Um, we looked at the angle. This is some average angle of the J side within the jet. So if the jet axis is here, we compute the average angle. Um, we saw that here's another way of saying that the Z dependence and the this some of this label is not the same as this label. Look at this, it's here. Okay. So the average angle is a function of Z change. So the, the 3PJ gave wider angle J psi than the 3S1, than the 1S0. And the yes one, so that was kind of interesting. Okay, so okay, this is okay. So I'm done. These are conclusions, not for the entire talk, really, but only that part of the talk uh, measuring about corcodion. So I think I'll just stop there and take questions. Questions in the room? Yeah. Is there um, ever conflict or with, between what you call a jet and what you don't? Like, do people disagree on uh, what what? Are there multiple algorithms? I don't even know it would, if it's disagree. I think you're allowed to define a jet any way you want. Okay. And so, I think so. There's a lot of algorithms out there. Um, the the key thing that you would like if you're gonna do something sensible is this condition called infrared safety. And John would describe that. So infrared safety is I take a bunch of particles with some momentum, okay? I take one of those particles and I replace it with two particles, one with, with, with the collinear momentum, one with Z times that momentum, and one with one with Z. So that's what you would expect if a collinear particle split into two collinear particles. And it also includes the soft case if I take Z to zero or one. Okay, and your observable cannot be sensitive to that, or the infrared divergences aren't going to cancel in QCD. And so, some algorithms are nice in that they have this property, some of them don't. So, that's one thing I think there's a general preference for infrared safe algorithms. It doesn't mean that there are algorithms or jet definitions that don't satisfy. Okay. What if I scroll up to show what I was saying? Yeah, I mean, just it was one of the first images, which I just thought was kind of interesting. Um, question mark. That's dangerous. <laughs> like that. Uh, yeah, like this over here. I, like, okay, maybe there's a way of, of showing how all these particles are correlated, and you can say that this is a jet. What about this one? Is this? Well, is this one? So the thing is, this is a. These tracks of one electron momentum. That's that's something that this is happening. So it's probably happening is this are isn't tracks. repeating tracks, but it's leaving a lot of energy in the hadron. You see that big tower up there? Uh -huh. So that's probably why that's changing. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So, so this is something that I guess it was initiated by like maybe Cruz of really hard to try on and this neutral managed to make it to the hadron number of them. So it's not just necessarily like the density of events, but like the energy deposited. Yeah, typically. Okay, so that's the whole story. In itself. Okay. There's different ways of going after. I mean, there's different experimental methods. You can use hadron clump, hadron catalog limiter data. Thank you. Only. Right, or you can use. There's just the one by charges. This is um, there's 
it's up to the experimentalist how they're going to say define the particles that they're going to call the gel. Okay. Okay. Um, so you also to use the theorist also to tell us what are the most useful ways to define the jets in the particle physics. Well, there's ways of defining the jet or from bizarre physics. Um, Actually, part of your question is it's very important because I mean, it's not a matter of disagreeing with particles going to jet, but you can study like how does your cross section change as you vary which particles mm -hmm. you're going to count as part of the jet or not. Simplest ways to vary the jet is it's tends to cross section to the radius. So, another so thing is something dangerous. Please go off the screen. So, if you use like charged particles, for instance, you jet, you're going to miss your neutral atoms. So, I think the thinking is that, hey, you, you lose a third of the atoms in the jets, you only look at this side. Do you see these lines are curving? That's because they're magnetic field. So, these are all charged particles. Um, and so, so, so typically they use data from the, the hadron collider, but they can also look at charge jets and what the charge particles are doing, maybe correct for it. You know. So, so that's an important question. So, so yeah, when you get in the weeds here, there's a lot of technical questions when you start talking about what is a jet. I mean, my four slides on that, I would say just scratch the surface. Similarly, with the substructure variable, I should do one, but there's dozens that you can study. In fact, I think in Yvonne's talk, you're going to talk about energy energy correlators. Okay, I mean, there's some other ones in the chapter on jets, but but really go to one of the review articles on jets and you'll see that there's a there's 40 different things that they do. The people who do this will like they'll want to study, they'll want to distinguish like top jets from something else, and they'll want every single algorithm that's been thought of to see which have discriminatory power. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, does anybody else have a question? Anyone on Zoom? You want to raise your hand or leave a chat? In time, I'll ask the question. Okay. Um, what, you want to scroll him back to <laughs> <laughs> color octet matrix elements? Yeah, I know exactly what that is. If you did the, if you showed their, so you did the seventh, their numbers. Which one are you talking about? Really, when, he, when, when Tom first said that the color arctic matrix elements were the about upper bounds. Oh, so uh, uh, earlier, so earlier. The screw all the way, it's it's uh, right there. The screw down a little bit. Is that what you want to see? Uh, almost, maybe a little bit earlier. A little earlier. This, earlier. Earlier. this section right here. Okay, let's talk about this. Actually, if you go one more earlier. So when you introduced uh, color octet, yeah, you showed that color singlet by itself constitutes the measurement of like orders of magnitude. And then you said the color octet fixes that. But uh, is, there, is there an easy way to see how color octet matrix elements which are down by four powers of B for color singlet? Because you know, that okay, so, so one difference. thing is, this is kind of the antiquity. This is probably historical. Significance, but mm -hmm. you shouldn't pay too much attention to what's going on here. It's like so if you do color sigma fragmentation, mm -hmm. if you do color sigma model, then you do a diagram where two gluons come in, you create the system bar pair, another gluon comes off, and then and, and then that diagram has two off-shell lines. And when you analyze it, that falls off like PT to the A because of that. So that's why this leading order for a student model calculation goes like this. This is a log line. It has a lot of slope. It's the long power of P. Now, if you do color single fragmentation, you do glue glue, goes to blue, followed by glue glue, followed by glue doing that fragmentation. That's a very hard work process because, as, as I said earlier, you have to admit two extra soft ones. So that's like alpha S to the fifth, mm -hmm. right? If you do color sigma model, a color octet at lowest order, you do glue glue, this is glue, this is glue glue, and that glue frames to the seats. You just tie that to two C, C bar points. There's no any, any orders. So there's an alpha S square that's killing this calculation that makes up for that. 
Also, when you do three body face space, because you have to get rid of all those blue ones in the presentation, you'll see. Let, let me go back to where I wrote down the analytical expression for the fragmentation. Yeah. Okay, stop. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, this is what you get when you put those two blue ones. And you see, there's a factor of 648 pi squared, like the four pi. Squares you get these new diagrams. It isn't there. This guy has a pie upstairs. I don't know where it sits on the days. <laughs> but but so there's a couple of different things that more than compensate with the thing. Now, when I said that that calculation is kind of antiquated, there was a time when the first thing first came out, there might have been an excellent order calculation for photo production. Mm -hmm. In the color single model. That was the only higher order calculation in all programming physics when I started. There was no NLO anything. So the story gets much more complicated now when you get to next living order because these PTZ expressions start to disappear because you can have higher order graphs that don't have, have PT dependence that's close to So it's, it's a more complicated story. That was the story of that picture. Okay. I'm going to ask you a final question. What do you think is the most likely explanation of the polarization puzzle? Well, I think and you're being recorded. Go for it. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I think those guys might be right that. Um, That one is zero is dominant, and, and you just have to. Um, I, I don't really have a good idea about that. I know that's not as happy as it's not. But, but I think then we have to, if that really is the answer, then we have to really think about how we calculate for going production at low, lower PT. But that's what TMD means. Right? So maybe there's a way you can do the global fitting where you use sort of TMD. When the PT was over 2MC, and as you went up the highest PT, you sort of matched on to these collinear factorization calculations and the fragmentation approximation of the bottom we did. And so then you can get a global coverage. You might think that the TMD factorization formalism, TMD, TMDs might be part of the answer to that problem. So you can write down a formalism as you go all the way from zero PT all the way there. Maybe I'll answer that, your question that way. Maybe that's a, really that's a good answer for the TMD school. Low PT physics better. Okay, I don't see anyone raising their hand on Zoom. Okay. And we have coffee, so why don't we thank Tom? We'll have uh, Ivan Vitev talk at uh, 4 p.m.